That looks like me when I wake up in the morning. It's gonna get spooky, guys. I'm scared and I'm tipsy, y'all. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Sydney, and if you are new here, this is just a place where we can talk about true crime, spooky stories, dark history, basically anything I got going on my brain. We sit down and we talk about it. I know September has just begun, okay, but it is almost fall and that means it's almost Halloween. You'll probably see my background changing quite a bit as we get closer to Halloween. It's one of my favorites, so I added my little jack-o'-lantern, my little bat lights back there. But in the spirit of the holidays, if you will, I thought that we could read some creepypasta stories. I used to love getting scared reading creepypastas, and I kind of got away from it for a while, and I don't really know why, but I kind of wanted to go back to my roots today and scare myself shitless. So I thought we would have a little claws and creepypasta. I tried to find ones that I hadn't read yet. And so the three that we're gonna be talking about today, I have not read. The last one I have heard about, but I've never read it. So I thought we could take some time today to do that. So without any further ado, let's get into it. This lukewarm white claw that I'm gonna drink. Oh yeah, that is not cold at all. You think I'd be better prepared for this, but alas, I am a true procrastinator. Um, this is blackberry. Not much to say about it. It's a white claw. Before we jump into it today, I do want to say viewer discretion is advised for this video. Just because creepypastas usually have talk of self-harm, suicide, that kind of thing, maybe even gore. I'm not exactly sure because I have not read these creepypastas, but I'm just putting it out there. If if you're sensitive to any of these topics, just be aware, just take care of yourself, okay? Awesome. So our first story today is called The Rake. A suicide note, 1964. As I prepare to take my life, I feel it necessary to assuage any guilt or pain I have introduced through this act. It is not the fault of anyone other than him. For once I awoke and felt his presence. Once again, I awoke and heard his voice and looked into his eyes. I cannot sleep without the fear of what I might next awake to experience. I cannot ever wake. Goodbye. Found in the same wooden box were two empty envelopes addressed to William and Rose and one loose personal letter with no envelope. A journal entry translated from Spanish, 1880. I have experienced the greatest terror I have experienced the greatest terror. I have experienced the greatest terror. I see his eyes when I close mine. They are hollow, black. They saw me and pierced me, his wet hand. I will not sleep, his voice. A mariner's log, 1691. He came to me in my sleep. From the foot of my bed, I felt a sensation. He took everything. We shall not return here again at the request of the rake. Oh, I just got like a really weird chill because <laughs> there's this, I'm going to put the picture up, but oh, that is not pleasant. That looks like me when I wake up in the morning, like <laughs> from a witness, 2006. Three years ago, I had just returned from a trip to Niagara Falls with my family for the 4th of July. We were all very exhausted after a long day of driving. So my husband and I put the kids right to bed and called it a night. At about 4 a.m., I woke up thinking my husband had gotten up to use the restroom. I used this moment to steal back the sheets, only to wake him in the process. I apologized and told him I thought he had gotten out of bed. When he turned to face me, he gasped and pulled his feet up from the end of the bed so quickly his knees almost knocked me out of the bed. Then he grabbed me and said nothing. After adjusting to the dark for half a second, I was able to see what had caused a strange reaction. At the foot of the bed, sitting and facing away from us, there was what appeared to be a naked man or a large hairless dog of some sort. Its body positioned was disturbed and unnatural, as if it had been hit by a car or something. For some reason, I was not instantly frightened by it, but more concerned as to its condition. At this point, I was somewhat under the assumption that we were supposed to help him. My husband was peering over his arm and knee, tucked into the fetal position, occasionally glancing at me before returning to the creature. In a flurry of motion, the creature scrambled around the side of the bed and then crawled quickly in a flailing sort of motion right along the bed until it was less than a foot away from my husband's face. The creature was completely silent for about 30 seconds, or probably closer to five, it just seems like a while. Just looking at my husband, the creature then placed its hand on his knee and ran into the hallway leading to the kids' room. I'm thoroughly spooked right now, y'all. It's been what, like 
Not even half a creepypasta. I screamed and ran for the light switch, planning to stop him before he hurt my children. When I got to the hallway, the light from the bedroom was enough to see it crouching and hunched over about 20 feet away. He turned around and looked directly at me, covered in blood. I flipped the switch on the wall and saw that he had my daughter, Clara. The creature ran down the stairs while my husband and I rushed to help our daughter. She was very badly injured and spoke only once more in her short life. She said, he is the rake. My husband drove his car into a lake that night while rushing our daughter over to the hospital. He did not survive. Being in a small town, news got around pretty quickly. The police were helpful at first, and then the local news took a lot of interest as well. However, the story was never published and local television news never followed up either. For several months, my son Justin and I stayed in a hotel near my parents' house. After we decided to return home, I began looking for the answers myself. I eventually located a man in the next town over who had a similar story. We got into contact and started talking about our experiences. He knew of two other people in New York who had seen the creature we now referred to as the rake. That better be my cats, I swear to God. It took the four of us about two solid years of hunting on the internet and writing letters to come up with a small collection of what we believe to be accounts of the rake. None of them gave us any detail, history, or follow-up. One journal had an entry involving the creature in its first three pages, and it never mentioned it again. A ship's log explained nothing of the encounter, saying only that they were told to leave by the rake. That was the last entry in the log. There were, however, many instances where the creature's visits was one of a series of visits with the same person. Multiple people also mentioned being spoken to, my daughter included. This led us to wonder if the rake had visited any of us before our last encounter. I set up a digital recorder near my bed and left it running all night, every night, for two weeks. I would tediously scan through the sounds of me rolling around in my bed each day when I woke up. By the end of the second week, I was quite used to the occasional sound of sleep while blurring through the recordings at eight times the normal speed. This still took almost an hour every day. On the first day of the third week, I thought I heard something different. What I found was a shrill voice. It was the rake. I can't listen to it long enough to even begin to transcribe it. I haven't let anyone listen to it yet. All I know is that I've heard it before, and now I believe that it spoke when it was sitting in front of my husband. I don't remember hearing anything at the time, but for some reason, the voice on that recorder immediately brings me back to that moment. The thought that it must have gone through my daughter's head makes me very upset. I have not seen the rake since he ruined my life, but I know that he has been in my room while I slept. I know and fear that one night I'll wake up and see him staring at me. So that was the entire creepypasta, but now I'm just kind of looking at its origins and stuff. And it says, in an origin similar to that of Slender Man, the mythic creature known as the Rake originally evolved out of a 2005 thread on 4chan, where an anonymous poster on the B board suggested that contributors try to collaboratively come up with ideas for a new monster. After some initial back and forth discussion, one particular idea was chosen as the most promising candidate and began to be formed adding and manipulated by several users. That was very scary, but I do have to blame that partly on my cats because they were playing with all my hair accessories. And I swear to God, I thought somebody was in our apartment. Everybody's texting me right now, stop it. I don't get text all day until I'm doing something. Our next creepypasta is called Abandoned by Disney. Some of you may have heard that the Disney Corporation is responsible for at least one real live ghost town. Disney built the Treasure Island Resort in Baker's Bay in the Bahamas. It didn't start as a ghost town. Disney cruise ships would actually stop at the resort and leave tourists up there to relax in luxury. This is a fact. Look it up. Disney blew 30 million on that place. Yes, 30 million dollars. Then they abandoned it. Disney blamed the shallow waters, too shallow for their ships to safely operate. And there was even blame cast on the workers, saying that since they were from the Bahamas, they were too lazy to work a regular schedule. That's where the factual nature of the story ends. It wasn't because of the sand, and it obviously wasn't because foreigners are lazy. Both are convenient excuses. No, I sincerely doubt those reasons were legitimate. Why don't I buy the official story? Because of Mowgli's palace. Near the beachside city of Emerald Isle in Northern Carolina, I can't say North Carolina. <laughs> of Emerald Island, uh, I'm not even drunk, I just can't talk. Near the beachside city of Emerald Isle in North Carolina, 
Disney began construction of Mowgli's Palace in the late 1990s. The concept was a jungle-themed resort with a large, you guessed it, palace in the center of the whole thing. If you're unfamiliar with the character Mowgli, then you might better remember the story The Jungle Book. If you haven't seen it anywhere else, you'd know it as the Disney cartoon from decades past. Mowgli is an abandoned child in the jungle, essentially raised by animals and simultaneously threatened and pursued by other animals. Mowgli's palace was a controversial undertaking from the start. Disney bought up a ton of high-priced land for the project, and there was actually a scandal surrounding some of the purchases. The local government claimed eminent domain on people's homes, then turned around and sold the properties to Disney. At one point, a home that had just been constructed was immediately condemned with little to no explanation. The land grabbed by the government was supposedly for some fictional highway project. Knowing full well what was going on, people started calling it Mickey Mouse Highway. Then there was concept art. A group of stuffed shirts from Disney actually held a city meeting. They intended to sell everyone on how lucrative this project was going to be for everyone. When they showed the concept art, this gigantic, Indian palace, surrounded by jungle, staffed with men and women in loincloths and tribal gear. Well, suffice to say, everyone flipped their shit. We're talking about a large Indian palace, jungle, and loincloths, not only in the center of a relatively wealthy area, but also somewhat xenophobic area of the southern United States. It was a questionable mix at that point in history. One member of the crowd tried to storm the stage, but he was quickly subdued by security after he managed to break one of the presentation boards over his knee. Disney took that community and essentially broke it over its knee as well. The houses were raised, the land was cleared, and there wasn't a damn thing anyone could do or say about it. Local TV and newspapers were against the resort at the beginning, but some insane connection between Disney's media holdings and the local venues came into play and their opinions turned on a dime. So anyway, Treasure Island in the Bahamas. Disney sunk those millions in and then split. The same thing happened with Mowgli's Palace. Construction was complete. Visitors actually stayed at the resort. The surrounding communities were flooded with traffic and the usual annoyances associated with an influx of lost and irate tourists. Then it all stopped. It's gonna get spooky, guys. Disney shut it down and nobody knew what the hell to think, but they were pretty happy about it. Disney's loss was pretty hilarious and wonderful to a large group of folks who didn't want it this in the first place. Honestly, I didn't give the place another thought since hearing it closed over a decade ago. I lived maybe four hours from Emerald Isle, so really I only heard the rumblings and didn't experience any of it firsthand. Then I read this article from someone who had explored Treasure Island Resort and posted a whole blog about all the crazy shit he found. Stuff just left behind. Things smashed, defaced, probably ruined by the disgruntled former employees who had lost their jobs. Hell, the locals from all over probably had a hand in wrecking that place. People felt just as angry about Treasure Island as folks here did about Mowgli's palace. Plus, there were rumors that Disney had released their aquarium, Stock, into the local waters when they closed, including sharks. Who wouldn't want to take a few swings at some merchandise after that? Well, what I'm getting at is that this blog about Treasure Island got me thinking. Even though many years had passed since its closing, I figured it might be cool to do some urban exploration at Mowgli's Palace. Take some photos, write about my experience, and probably see if there was anything I could take home as a memento. I'm not going to say I wasted no time getting there, because honestly, it took me another year after I first found the Treasure Island article to get around to going up to Emerald Isle. Over the course of that year, I did do a lot of research on the palace resort, or rather, I tried to. Naturally, no official Disney site or resource made any mention of the place. That had been scrubbed clean. Even odder, however, was that nobody before myself had apparently thought to blog about the place or even post a photo. None of the local TV or newspaper sites had one word about the place, though that was expected since they had all swung Disney's way. Recently, I learned that corporations can actually ask Google, for example, to remove links from search results, basically for no good reason. So in the end, I could barely find the place. All I had to go on was an old as hell map I'd received in the mail back in the 90s. It was a promotional item sent out to people who had recently been to Disney World, and I guess since I'd been there in the late 80s, that was recent. I didn't really intend to hang on to it. It just got shoved in with my books and comics from my childhood. I'd only remembered it months into my research, and even then it took me another few weeks to locate the storage pin my parents had shoved it all into. But I did find it. Locals were no help, as most were transplants who had moved to the beach in recent years or 
old residents who just stared at me and made rude gestures the second I managed to say, where would I happen to find Mowgli's? The drive took me through an inordinately long corridor of overgrowth, tropical plants that had run rampant and overpopulated the area, mixed with the native species of flora that actually belonged there and had tried to reclaim the land. I was in awe when I reached the front gates of the resort. Tremendous monolithic wooden gates whose supports to either side looked like they must have been cut from giant sequoias. The gate itself had been gouged in several places by woodpeckers and eaten away at the base by burrowing insects. Hanging onto the gate was a sheet of metal, some random scrap, with hand-painted letters scrawled in black abandoned by Disney. Clearly the handiwork of some past local or an employee who wanted to make some small protest. The gates were open enough to walk through but not to drive, so I grabbed my digital camera and the map and I set off on foot. The inner grounds of the place were just as overgrown as the entryway. Palm trees stood unattended and ragged among piles of their own coconuts. Banana plants similarly stood in their own stinking, bug-riddled refuse. There was this sort of clash between order and chaos, as carefully planted rows of perennial flowers mixed with obnoxiously tall weeds and stinking, blackening mushrooms. All that remained of any outdoor structures were broken, rotting wood and various charred bits of unidentifiable material. What was most likely an information booth or an outdoor bar was now simply a pile of assorted debris, chopped up by past vandalism and ravaged by weather. The most interesting thing on the grounds was a statue of Baloo, the friendly bear from the Jungle Book, which stood in sort of a courtyard in front of the main building. He was frozen in a jovial wave towards no one, staring into empty space with a silly, toothy grin as bird shit covered whole swaths of his fur and vines ensnared his platform. I approached the main building, the palace, only to find that the outside of the building was covered in graffiti where the original paint hadn't been peeled and chipped away. The front doors weren't just open, they had been taken off their hinges and were stolen. Above the front doors, or the gaping maw where they had been, somebody had once again painted, abandoned by Disney. I wish I could tell you about all the awesome stuff I found inside the palace. Forgotten statues, abandoned cash registers, a full-fledged secret society of homeless bums. But no, the inside of the building was so stark, so bare, that I actually thought think people had stolen the molding off the walls. Anything that was too big to steal, counters, desks, giant fig trees, they were all resting amid this empty echo chamber that amplified my every step like a slow rat-tat-tat of a machine gun. I checked the floor plan and headed to all the locations that might seem in any way interesting. The kitchen, as you might imagine, an industrial food prep area with all the appliances and space, no expenses spared. Every glass surface was broken, every door knocked off its hinges, every metal surface kicked and dented. The entire place smelled like very old piss. The huge freezer, not even remotely cool now, had row upon row of empty shelf space. Hooks hung from the ceiling, probably for hanging cuts of meat. As I stood there for a moment, I noticed they were swinging. Each hook swung in a random direction, but their movements were so slow and small that it would have been almost impossible to see. I figured it had been caused by my footsteps, so I stopped one from swinging by clutching it in my fist, then carefully letting it go. But within seconds, it started to swing once more. The public bathrooms were in much the same state as the rest of the place. Just like the Treasure Island Resort, somebody had methodically smashed each porcelain commode with coconuts and other implements. There was about half an inch of rancid, stinking, stagnant water on the floor, so I didn't stay there very long. What's odd is that the toilets and the sinks all dripped, leaked or just ran freely. It seemed to me that they should have just shut off the water long ago. There were plenty of rooms in the resort, but naturally I didn't have the time to look through them all. The few I did peer into were similarly wrecked and I didn't expect to find anything there. I thought there was actually a television or a radio in one room, as I really think I heard a quiet conversation coming out. Though it was like a whisper, probably my own breathing echoing in the silence, or just another case of the sound of flowing water playing tricks on the mind. This is what it sounded like. One. I didn't believe it. Two. Short, unknown reply. One. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Two. Your father told you. One. Unknown reply, or possibly weeping. I know. I know that sounds ridiculous. I'm just telling you what I experienced. Why I thought there might have been something running in that room, or worse, some vagrants who had holed up there and probably would have knifed me. 
At the front doors of the palace again, I figured I hadn't found anything of note and had wasted the trip. As I looked out the door, I noticed something interesting in the courtyard that I had apparently missed. Something that would have given me at least one thing to show for all my trouble, even if it was just a photograph. There was a lifelike statue of a python, maybe 50 feet long, coiled up and sunning itself on a pedestal right in the center of the area. It was almost time for the sun to start setting, so the light fell onto the object in the perfect way for a photograph. I approached the python and snapped a photo. Then I stood on my toes and snapped another. I moved closer to get the details of its face. Slowly, casually, the python lifted up its head, looked directly in my eyes, turned and slithered off the pedestal, across the grass and into the trees, all 50 feet of it. Its head long disappeared into the woods before the tail even left the sunning spot. Disney had released all of their exotic animals onto the grounds. Right there on my floor plan map was the reptile house. I should have known. I read all about the sharks at Treasure Island, and I should have known they'd done this. I was dumbfounded, just utterly stupefied. My mouth must have been hanging open for the longest time before I came back down to earth and snapped it shut. I blinked a few times and backed away from where the snake had been, back towards the palace. Even though it was totally gone, I still wasn't taking any chances and backed my way into the building. I looked for a place to sit down as my legs were sort of feeling like jelly at this point. Of course, there was no place to sit down unless I wanted to recline in the broken glass and dead leaf carpet or haul myself up onto a desk of questionable reliability. I had seen some stairs near the palace's lobby and decided to go have a seat there until I felt better. The staircase was far enough away from the front of the building to be relatively clean, save for the startling accumulation of dust. I pulled a wedge of metal off the wall, once again painted with the abandoned by Disney motto I'd become accustomed to. I placed the wedge on the stairs and sat on it to keep at least somewhat clean. The stairway led downward, below ground level. Using my camera flash as sort of an improvised flashlight, I could see that the staircase ended in a metal mesh door with a padlock. The sign on the door, a real sign, read, mascots only, thank you. This perked up my spirits a little bit for two reasons. One, a mascots only area would have definitely had some interesting stuff back in the day. Two. The padlock was still in place. Nobody had gone down there. Not the vandals, not the looters, nobody. This was the one place I could actually explore and perhaps find something interesting to photograph or wantonly steal. I had come to the palace essentially agreeing with myself that it was okay to take anything I wanted because, hey, abandoned. It didn't take much to bust the lock. Well, actually, that's wrong. It didn't take much to bust the metal plate on the wall that the padlock was hooked to. Time and decay had done most of the work for me, and I was able to bend the metal plate enough to pull the screws out of the wall, something nobody else had apparently thought of or hadn't been able to do at the time. The mascot's only area was a startling and very welcome change from the rest of the building I'd seen. For one, every second or third fluorescent light overhead was illuminated, even though they flickered and faded randomly. Also, nothing had been stolen or broken even if age and exposure were definitely taking their toll. Tables had notepads and pens. There were clocks, even a punch-in clock on the wall, complete with filled out time cards. Chairs were scattered around and there was even a small break room with an old static filled television and long rotted out food and drink on the counters. It was like one of those post-apocalyptic movies where everything is left in a state of evacuation. As I walked the maze-like sub-basement hallways of the mascot only area, the sights just became more and more interesting. As I walked further, desks and tables were knocked over, papers scattered and almost melded with the damp floor, and a large carpet of mold was slowly overtaking the real rotting crimson floor covering. Everything was just sort of squishy. Anything wood disintegrated into mush when I applied even the slightest bit of force, and clothing items hanging on hooks in one of the rooms simply fell into moist threads if I tried to unhook them. One thing that annoyed me was that the light was becoming more and more sparse and unreliable as I went farther into the dark, suffocating depths of the place. Eventually, I reached a black and yellow striped door with the words, Character Prep 1 stenciled into it. The door wouldn't open at first. I figured that this was probably where the costumes were kept, and I definitely wanted a photograph of that twisted, stinking mess. Try as I might, whatever angle or trick I tried, the door wouldn't budge. That is, until I gave up and started to walk away. That was when there was a slight popping sound, and the door slowly creaked open. Inside, the room was completely dark, pitch black. 
I used the camera flash to look for a light switch on the wall, but there was nothing. As I made my search, I was jarred out of my sense of excitement by a loud electrical buzz. Rows of lights overhead suddenly flashed to light, flickering and fading in and out like the rest of them I had passed. It took a second for my eyes to adjust, and it seemed like the light was going to just keep getting brighter and brighter until all the bulbs exploded. But just when I thought it would reach that critical stage, the lights dimmed a bit and steadied. The room was exactly how I'd pictured it. Various Disney costumes hung on the walls, fully put together like strange cartoon cadavers hanging from invisible nooses. There was an entire rack of loincloths and native clothes on hangers towards the back. What I found odd and what I wanted to photograph right away was a Mickey Mouse costume at the center of the room. Unlike the other costumes, it was laying on its back in the center of the floor like a murder victim. The fur on the costume was rotten and shedding, creating bare patches. What was even more odd, however, was the coloring of the costume. It was like a photo negative of the actual Mickey Mouse. Black where he should have been white and, and white where he should have been black. His normal red pants were light blue. The sight was off-putting enough that I actually postponed photographing the thing until last. I took a picture of the costumes hanging on the walls. Upward angles, downward angles, side shots to show the entire room of frozen, putrid, cartoon faces, some with plastic eyes missing. Then I decided to stage a shot just one of the characters' heads on the sick, grimy floor. I reached for the headpiece of a Donald Duck costume and carefully removed it so that the thing wouldn't fall apart in my hands. As I looked into the face of this wide-eyed, moldering head, a loud clattering sound made me jump with fright. I looked down at my feet, and there, between my shoes, was a human skull. It had fallen out of the mascot head and shattered into pieces at my feet. Only the empty face and lowering jaw remained staring up at me. I dropped the duck head immediately as you would expect and moved for the door. As I stood in the doorway, I looked back to the skull on the floor. I had to take a picture of it, you know? I, I, ha I had to, for any number of reasons that may seem silly, but only if you don't think it through. I'd need proof of what happened, especially if Disney was gonna somehow make this go away. I had no doubt in my mind right from the start that even if this was just gross negligence, Disney was responsible for this. This is why the resort had to close and I was the only one outside of Disney company who knew. Me. That's when Mickey, that photo negative opposite Mickey in the middle of the floor, started to get up. First sitting, then climbing to its feet, the Mickey Mouse costume or whoever was inside it stood there at the center of the room, its fake face just staring directly at me as I mumbled, no, over and over and over, with shaking hands, a violent thrashing heart, and legs that once again turned to jelly, I managed to lift the camera and aim it at the opposite creature now quietly sizing me up, head tilted. The digital camera screen displayed only dead pixels on the shape of that thing. It was a perfect silhouette of the Mickey costume. As the camera moved in my unsteady hand, the dead pixels spread, then the camera died. Went blank and quiet and broken. I raised my eyes once again to the Mickey Mouse costume. You know what, I'm just gonna pause here. I haven't really been talking because I've been really hooked on this story. This is actually very well written. I wish I had, could do a Mickey Mouse voice. I really wish I could. I can't. Cause this would be the perfect opportunity to pull that shit out. But anyway, hey. It said in a hushed, perverted, but perfectly executed Mickey Mouse voice. Wanna see my head come off? It started to pull at its own head, working its clumsy, gloved fingers around its neck with clawing, impatient movements, similar to a wounded man trying to pull himself free of predator's jaws. As it worked its digits into its neck, so much blood, so much thick, curdled, yellow blood, I turned away as I heard a sickening tearing of cloth and flesh. I only cared about getting away. Above the doorway of this room, I saw the final message clawed into the metal with bone or fingernails, abandoned by God. I never got the pictures out of that camera. I never wrote the blog entry about it. After I ran from that place, fled for my sanity, if not my very life, I knew why Disney didn't want anyone to know about this place. They didn't want anyone like me getting in. They didn't want anything like that getting out. That was scary. 
That delivered. I was not expecting it to go there. Also, I always make the mistake of when I'm making a video where I'm drinking, of not eating before because I'm scared. I'm scared and I'm tipsy, y'all. Our last little story today is a short one, but I have actually never read Candle Cove. And if you're an enthusiast of horror and especially like analog horror, you're probably like, what the fuck? How have you never read Candle Cove? I just haven't, okay? I just haven't. Don't quote me on this. I'm not actually 100% sure. I just kind of was like skimming through a few articles. The author of this story, um, his name is Chris Straub, I think. And he actually wrote this original story. And I think Candle Cove got turned into not an ARG, but like a TV show, which I didn't know was even a thing. But also, Chris has brought many other awesome analog horror, like Local 58, which is like one of my favorite things ever. So I thought it would only be fair that we finish off our little creepypasta, our little claws and creepypasta by reading Candle Cove. Our first entry from Skyshell 033. Subject, Candle Cove local kids show. Does anyone remember this kids show? It was called Candle Cove, and it must have been six or seven. I never found reference to it anywhere, so I think it was on a local station around 1971 or 1972. I lived in Ironton at the time. I don't remember what station, but I do remember it was on at a weird time, like 4 p.m. Mike underscore painter 65. It seems really familiar to me. I grew up outside of Ashland and was nine years old in 72. Candle Cove. Was it about pirates? I remember a pirate marionette at the mouth of a cave talking to a little girl. Skyshell 033. Yes, okay, I'm not crazy. I remember Pirate Percy. I was always kind of scared of him. He looked like he was built out of parts from other dolls. Real low budget. His head was an old porcelain baby doll. Looked like an antique that didn't belong on his body. I don't remember what station this was. I don't think it was WTSF though. Jaren underscore 2005. Sorry to resurrect this old thread, but I know exactly what show you mean, Skyshell. I think Candle Cove only ran for a few months in 71, not 72. I was 12 and I watched it a few times with my brother. It was channel 58, whatever station that was. My mom would let me switch to it after the news. Let me see what I can remember. It took place in Candle Cove and it was about this little girl who imagined herself to be friends with pirates. The pirate ship was called Laughing Stock and Pirate Percy wasn't a very good pirate because he always got scared too easily. And there was this calipi music constantly playing. Don't remember the girl's name, Janice or Jade or something. I think it was Janice. Skyshell 033. Thank you, Jaren. Memories flooded back when you mentioned the laughing stock in Channel 58. I remember the bow of the ship was a wooden smiling face with the lower jaw submerged. It looked like it was swallowing the sea and it had this awful Ed Wynn voice and laugh. I especially remember how jarring it was when they switched from the wooden plastic model to the foam puppet version of the head that talked. Mike underscore painters 65. I remember now too. Do you remember this part, Skyshell? You have to go inside. Skyshell 033. Ugh, Mike, I got chills reading that. Yes, I remember. That's what the ship always told Percy when there was a spooky place that he had to go in, like a cave or a dark room where there was treasure and the camera would push in on Laughingstock's face with each pause. You have to go inside. With his two eyes askew and that flopping foam jaw and the fishing line that opened and closed it, ugh, it just looks so cheap and awful. You guys remember the villain? He had a face that was just a handlebar mustache above really tall, narrow teeth. Kevin underscore heart. I honestly, honestly thought that the villain was Pirate Percy. I was about five when the show was on. Nightmare fuel. Jaren underscore 2005. That wasn't the villain, the puppet with the mustache. That was the villain's sidekick, Horace Horrible. He had a monocle too, but that was on top of the mustache. I used to think that meant he only had one eye. But yeah, the villain was another marionette, the skin taker. I can't believe what they let us watch back then. Kevin underscore heart. Jesus H. Christ, the skin taker. What kind of a kid's show were we watching? I seriously could not look at the screen when the skin taker showed up. He just descended out of nowhere on his strings, just a dirty skeleton wearing that brown top hat and cape. His glass eyes were too big for a skull, Christ almighty. Skyshell 033. Wasn't his top hat and cloak all sewn up crazily? Was that supposed to be 
children's skin? Mike underscore painter 65. Yeah, I think so. Remember his mouth didn't open and close? His jaw just slid back and forth? I remember the little girl said, why does your mouth move like that? And the skin taker didn't look at the girl, but at the camera and said, to grind your skin. Skyshell 033. I'm so relieved that other people remember this terrible show. I used to have this awful memory. A bad dream I had, where the opening jingle ended, the show faded in from black, and all the characters were there, but the camera was just cutting to each of their faces, and they were just screaming, and the puppets and the marionettes were flailing spastically and all just screaming, screaming. The girl was just moaning and crying like she had been through hours of this. I woke up many times from that nightmare. I used to wet the bed when I had it. Kevin underscore heart. I don't think that was a dream. I remember that. I remember that was an episode. Skyshell 033. <laughs> no, 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 that's not possible. There was no plot or anything. I mean, literally just standing in place, crying and screaming for the whole show. So you probably noticed the switch in quality at this point. The camera I was using to record is acting up. I think it might be the SD card. I don't think it's actually the camera. But anyway, I literally had two more entries in Candle Cove and we didn't get to read them. So we're going to do that right now. Kevin underscore heart. Maybe I'm manufacturing the memory because you said that, but I swear to God, I remember seeing what you described. They just screamed. Jaren underscore 2005. The little girl Janice, I remember seeing her shake and the skin taker screamed through his gnashing teeth, his jaw careening so wildly I thought it would come off its wire hinges. I turned it off and it was the last time I watched. I ran to tell my brother and we didn't have the courage to turn it back on. Mike underscore painter 65. I visited my mom today in the nursing home. I asked her about when I was little in the early 70s, when I was eight or nine, and if she remembered a kid show, Candle Cove. She said she was surprised I could remember that, and I asked why. And she said, because I used to think it was so strange that you said, I'm gonna go watch Candle Cove now, mom. And then you would tune the TV to static and just watch dead air for 30 minutes. You had a big imagination with your little pirate show. And that is the end to Candle Cove. That went from zero to 100 really quick. But that is all the creepypastas I have for you guys today. I hope that you enjoyed. Again, I'm sorry about the little technical problems. I will have it fixed by our next video. But anyway, enjoy that nice weather. It's getting to be spooky season. Me and Ham Solo are ready to get spooky with y'all. It's gonna be a great spooky season. I have a lot of really cool stuff planned. So I am very, very, very excited and I hope that you guys are too. Thank you for watching. I hope that you guys enjoyed the video and keep being the bad bitches that you are. Bye guys. Mm -hmm.